get a prayer book? Yeah, get a prayer book. Good evening. It's great to be with you. I'm Father Anderson, Rector of St. Albans Anglican Church in Gotham, Maryland. And this evening I'm here at the parish with my live studio audience continuing our Lenten study on the seven sacraments. This evening we will be looking at the sacrament of holy matrimony. So um, if you want to get your prayer book out, the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, turn to page 300, and we will begin. We will, as always, open with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together this evening and fellowship and share our lives with one another and study the doctrines and teachings of the church. We pray that you would bless us in our conversation and our time together and uh, be with us and bless all of us in our Christian lives as we seek to know you and follow your ways and your path for us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, the Articles of Religion is where we started before with a lot of the sacraments. Um, if you want to turn to it, or keep your finger in two places, 300 uh, for the um, right of holy matrimony, solemnization of holy matrimony, and then we're just going to look really quickly, get some preliminary stuff out of the way, looking at Article um, uh, 32, which is on Book of Common Prayer, 1928, page 609. This really doesn't have much to do with a whole lot, but we have been looking at the sacraments as they relate to the articles of religion. Um, so I don't want to leave this out. Now, I know I can read your mind. You are thinking two things. The first thing is how can I donate money to St. Albans Church for the building fund? <laughs> Go to our website, www.saint, spelled out, S-A-I-N-T, Albans, Joppa.org. Go to Give, and you can make a donation for our building fund. And the website is being updated now, and we will have a whole separate page dedicated to our magnificent building project. And you can help. We need your help. So go to that, that's the first thing. I read your mind, now the second thing is you're wondering what happened to my glasses. No, I did not get contacts, no, I did not get Lasix, no, I did not have spittle rubbed on my eyes and my eyesight healed. I am getting um, my prescription changed and they have to keep my glasses for two weeks. You look like your third behind you. I do, that's right, <laughs> so my hair's a little grayer. <laughs> so, there we go. Now, Article 32 in the Articles of Religion, of the marriage of priests. Bishop, bishops, priests, and deacons are not commanded by God's law either to vow the estate of single life or to abstain from marriage. Therefore, it is lawful for them, as for all other Christian men, to marry at their own discretion, as they shall judge the same to serve better to godliness. So this article uh, is the rationale for why we have married clergy, or it explains that there's no impediment to, in the scriptures, having married clergy. Uh, that was something that developed in the Western Church primarily, though in the Eastern Church, bishops are not permitted to be married. Um, in the Western Church, no. The Latin Church, in, since about the 12th century, uh, no clergy were permitted to be married. Um, and that was viewed to be unscriptural. Now, why that developed was because of, uh, for legal issues, because the clergy would try to leave the, the church to their kids. So it'd be like me leaving St. Albans to my son or my daughter and, and becoming a little feudal lord and starting like a dukedom. So the Pope rightly said, no, 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 that's not allowed. But then they suppressed marriage for the clergy because of that. But time of the Reformation, though, um, it was deemed that you know marriage being a natural estate was open to all people that wished to uh, enter into it, and that included the clergy. So that's a little historical aside right there. And now we will look at the solemnization of holy matrimony on page three hundred. Um, Matrimony is considered one of the ecclesial sacraments of the church. 
if you remember from our earlier studies and from your own studies in the prayer book, uh, the difference between dominical and ecclesial sacraments, dominical sacraments were established specifically by the Lord Jesus and given an outward sign to accompany them, and they are necessary for salvation. So, um, in, the, uh, in the history of the church, around the 12th or 13th century, it was determined that matrimony was one of the seven sacraments. This was the last of the sacraments to be added to the, the list of seven sacraments. Um, I don't know that the Roman church has the distinction that we do between ecclesial and dominical sacraments. Uh, but, uh, and I went to a Roman Catholic seminary. I graduated from, from the Roman Catholic seminary. And I never remember hearing that distinction. But I think it's a very helpful distinction. <coughs> myself, because obviously not everyone is called to be married. And St. Paul mentions that in his letters, so you cannot say that a sacrament is necessary for salvation and then at the same time hold that, you know, it is necessary for every single person to be married in order to be saved. Um, so, we as Anglicans believe that this is a sacrament that is a uh, um, you know, optional. It's something that's instituted and blessed by, by Christ and the church, but not everyone is called to, to married life. Um, so there, there we go. Now, as always, what does the church teach about the theology of matrimony? Well, we go to the rites of matrimony itself, which is why we're looking here at page 300. So let's explore this, and then we will discuss further questions as they arise. Now, in our American prayer book, we have a truncated beginning of the historic Anglican rites. And I have here my very first Book of Common Prayer. This is a 1662 prayer book from the reign of King Edward VII. It was given to me by my late uncle. Um, and the 1662 English prayer book has the complete rite at the beginning of it. And I, I want to refer to that because that, even though that portion has been taken out of our prayer book, it still informs the meaning and theology of the right. Um, so, page 300. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate instituted of God, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. So let's unpack that. Instituted of God. When did God institute this? In the order of creation. So the, the theology of marriage is not rooted in some particular Bible verse. Like God says, go marry that blonde over there or that bald guy over there. It's in the story of creation. God created the universe, created everything that is, and the pinnacle of creation he made man, male and female, and he created them to be together and to procreate. So uh, the institution of marriage predates even the founding of the church and of all governments and societies. It's rooted in our very being as um, sexually bimorphous beings, male and female, instituted by God. Um, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. This comes from St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, which is the epistle that's read in a service of holy matrimony. And we are blessed to have a service of holy matrimony coming up here at St. Albans with one of our live studio audience members. <laughs> I will not say the name, but those who know, know. Um, so St. Paul in his epistle to the Ephesians states that marriage is a reflection of the union between Christ and his church. So Christ um, represents the, the groom and the church is his bride. Um, and I can pull a Bible. I might pull a Bible out and read that a little bit later. Um, actually, can someone grab me? Can you, can you grab me a Bible over there? Uh, we'll, we'll read that. Why not? We've got the time. Which holy estate, continuing on page 300, 
which holy estate Christ adorned, beatified, and beatified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee. So this is Jesus' first miracle in St. John's Gospel, where he turns water into wine. And because Jesus was present at this wedding, this uh, particular scripture reading is read during the Epiphany season in our calendar, um, it is viewed by the church that he honors and blesses marriage. Um, because Christ was there at the wedding and he took um, water and turned it into wine. Okay, I am going to just pull up this passage here. As my daughter says, search up this passage from Ephesians. Now, because I don't have glasses, I need to look here very carefully. Okay. What's that? <laughs> okay, I almost got it. Ephesians here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the passage that is read as the epistle in a communion service, a, what is called a nuptial mass in the Book of Common Prayer. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Um, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For no man ever, uh, excuse me, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So there is the connection where, where in the rite of holy matrimony, which we just read on page 300, it says that it is symbol, marriage symbolizes the unity betwixt or between Christ and his church. Um, so that's where that comes from, Ephesians chapter 5, and you can find the propers for that uh, in the Book of Common Prayer on page um, 267. Now continuing on page 300. And therefore, marriage is not by any to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, and in fear of God. Into this holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. If any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined, let him now speak, or else hereafter ever hold his peace. Now, a lot of stuff there. The ministers of the sacrament, every sacrament has a minister, the individual that makes the Confects it, makes it happen. A priest celebrates the Eucharist. Uh, a bishop confirms. A bishop uh, ordains. Who is the minister of the sacrament of holy matrimony? It is the man and the wife. They are the ministers. They agree to enter into this covenant. Uh, the church is there to witness this union and to pronounce God's blessing upon it. That's, that's what's happening here. Um, and they are advised, of course, to you know, really, think this, really think this through. Um, now, here's where I want to go to the 1662 prayer book, because what I just read to you there on page 300 in our prayer book is, is a truncated version of the original, um, original passage. Why could they leave it out? Who knows? I mean, save time. Uh, the question is, why did they leave it out? 
And, and they have put this back in, in some newer prayer books. I believe in the Anglican Church in North America prayer book, they've reinserted what I'm about to read uh, into the service. Um, a lot of it is because, I mean, they leave things out because you think people know all this stuff. Well, of course everyone knows X, Y, Z. Just leave it out. But then it's like, well, no, why, why is that fence over there? I don't know. I don't remember. Let's just take it down. You know, and then all hell breaks loose. You know, we get horses running into the church <laughs> one day. All right, so this is, this is what is left out of our prayer. It's very helpful, and it, 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 it guides the theology of the church. Is it duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained? So why was matrimony ordained? First, it was ordained for the procreation of children to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. So matrimony is ordered to procreation. Now, that does not mean that if, you know, you're of a, a certain age, not old, super good looking and young still. If you're able, if you're of childbearing age, um, you should try to have children and there's no health problems, things like that, things of that nature. Um, you, you should never enter into a marriage, Christian marriage, and we're going to draw a distinction here between Christian marriage and whatever the state authorizes as, as we go on. Christian marriage, um, well, and marriage naturally is oriented towards the procreation of children. That's what uh, biology teaches us. Um, now, let's say you cannot have kids. There's an impediment there, like you have a physical problem. Does that mean you don't have a marriage? No. Because, but for that problem, you would be able to have kids. So marriage is oriented toward the procreation of children. Now, I have been asked in the past, what about adoption? Does that count for procreation of children? Certainly, if you can't have kids on your own, absolutely. But I, my personal belief and understanding is that if you are of childbearing age, you should try to have kids. And that's a huge need in our society today. I was just here listening to a, a news report the other day about uh, Social Security. And Social Security, it's gonna run out in 10 years, it's doomed, it's doomed, it's doomed. Now it seems like it may happen. One of the problems is there's not enough, the population is in decline. You don't have enough people paying into it. You know, so when, I mean, and now, you know, communist China, they're saying, have two kids now. Come on, have kids, have kids. Because they're like, oh crap, we don't have enough people. You need more people paying into the system if you want, you know, social benefits and the things that we enjoy, a social safety net. So um, it's very important to, to try to have, have kids. And that's one of the reasons, and the, the theology of the church is it was ordained for the procreation of of children, so children need to be brought up in a home with a father and mother, um, you know, in the best possible circumstances, um, and it takes a lot to raise a kid. I have two kids. I wish I had more. I love kids, but I was stuck with two. I left with only two, and they're fantastic. I cherish them every second. Um, okay, let's continue. We'll go, all of this relates. We'll go back to all this stuff. Secondly, it was ordained for a remedy against sin to avoid fornication that such persons as have not the gift of continency might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. So sex outside of marriage in the Christian tradition is a sin. So you get married and then you can have lawful sexual relations. You don't want to just go willy-nilly sleeping with whoever and having kids because kids are a huge responsibility and it's unjust and, and evil to have a bunch of kids and leave them to someone else to raise the poor mother who naturally you know, has more care for them, the state or, or whoever. So if you don't have the gift of continency or celibacy, and some people do, that is a gift that St. Paul talks about. Um, you know, St. Paul says it's, you know, if, you, if you burn with passion, it's better just to, to get married so you can not sin against God and sin against your man. Every sin against God is also a sin against another person in one way or another. So that's the second reason 
Now, I should say, and then there's a third reason we'll get to. I should say there's probably a million reasons why you should get married. Um, you, you know, you could say get married or stay single if that's your calling. The prayer book here in 1662 lists just these three procreation of children, remedy against sin. And thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society help and comfort that the one might, that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. So it is ordained for the mutual help of the husband and the wife, which is what we see in um, the book of Genesis. Again, all this relates to the order of creation, how God's plan for humanity and the human race. It is not good for man to be alone. You know, he needs a helper, and she needs a helper, and we, they work together, and it's to comfort each other and to serve each other. Um, so those were the three reasons why marriage was, um, was ordained. Now, once I was asked, well, what's wrong if we just live together and have, a, have kids and don't actually get married? And uh, we were talking about this, and I said, well... If I'll tell you one of the things that's wrong with it, if so and so peels over, she gets nothing. She gets nothing because they're not married unless they set up some elaborate system. They don't get anything, you know. So you want to get you want to be married to have those legal protections, which is why the state is involved in marriage. See, a lot of times the church will say or Christians will say. The state should just get out of marriage and not be involved in it. It's just a religious thing. It is a religious thing, but it's also a natural thing. And the state is involved in marriage for very good reasons. Because of inheritance and property and, you know, who's descended from whom and so on. So it's kind of a very intertwined, intertwined uh, thing. Does this violate the separation of church and state? There is no separation of church and state. It is called the anti-establishment clause. In the United States, we do not have a, a national religion like the Church of England. Okay, but the reality is that church and state are kind of involved back and forth in, in a ton of ways that we find mutually beneficial and sometimes mutually vexing on, on both counts. So this is uh, some exciting and interesting stuff. Okay. Let's continue here, looking back at our 1928 prayer book, bottom of 300. I require and charge you both, as you will answer, the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why you may not lawfully be joined together in matrimony, you do not confess it. For be well assured that if any person is joined together otherwise than as God's word doth allow, their marriage is not lawful. Now, in our prayer book, we do not have this list, but in the um, English prayer book that I was just using, okay, there is a, at the very, very end, a table of kindred and affinity. <laughs> and it says, who may not marry whom? Oh, wow. <laughs> a man may, I'll just, I won't read the whole thing. It's all interchangeable. I'll just, Go down the man list. A man may not marry his grandmother, grandfather's wife, wife's grandmother, father's sister, mother's sister, father's brother's wife, mother's brother's wife, wife's father's sister, wife's mother's sister, mother, stepmother, wife's mother, daughter, wife's stuff, and it goes on as 30 of them. And then you just reverse the sexes for a woman may not marry. So that is one of the things that this is re this clause that I just read is referring to that. Uh, you know, if you're not joined together as God allows, then it's not a lawful um, marriage, or what we would say is a sacramental marriage. So what is a sacramental marriage? Okay, we're talking about sacraments here. Sacrament, a sacrament is um, an outward sign of an invisible grace given to us by God, instituted by Christ. That is the definition of a sacrament given in the catechism. Now, this is not a sacrament in that sense of the dominical sense, instituted by Christ, outward sign. But it is a sacrament in the sense of something, because sacraments are something that God uses to make us holy. And marriage is a peculiar state of life 
um, that some people are called to for a particular period um, in order to be made holy. God uses it to just help you grow in grace and be made holy in some way. Now, you might be thinking, I or something like that. But wait until you stand before God, you might be surprised. You know? um, marriage is a constant uh, way to grow in humility and, and love and, you know, um, see yourself for who you are, for real, you know? So, um, but not, there are, this is to say there's not, there's some marriages that are not lawful or sacramental. There, that list that I just read briefly from is only part of the story. So you could have a, 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 a an unlawful or unsacramental marriage, an invalid marriage for any number of reasons. The shotgun wedding, you know, did you ever see that video, the Georgia satellites, keep your hands to yourself? It's a really funny video, it's a great song. Georgia satellites, keep your hands to yourself. It, and the video, as they're singing the song, shows this story, and at the very end it shows this, this, this wedding's happening, and they're, they're putting a shotgun to the man's back, and his bride is there, and she's very pregnant, and they're making them get married. It's a, it's, it's a cute, cute little song, it's humorous and all that for a music video. Um, but that would be, assuming it's real, or something like that actually happens, an invalid marriage there would be an impediment because he is being forced against his will to be married. So you cannot force someone to marry. A daughter married off. You're marrying that old guy over there in 15 years, honey. You're his fiance now. She has, marriage has to be entered into in freedom in both parties. Otherwise, it is not a sacramental marriage. Um, or if you are you know, I'm marrying my brother. That is not a sacramental marriage, according to the list. I'm marrying my sister. That is not allowed. That is not a sacramental marriage. Um, I'm already married to someone. In fact, I'm married to three people and a dog over there. Mm. You can only be married to one person. So there's a number of things that can make a marriage invalid from a Christian sacramental perspective. Um, I have a question. Yes, there's a question. So, um, if someone gets married in the church, you know, with a mass and yourself, because when our daughter got married, on the invitation it said, you were invited to the sacrament of matrimony between blah, 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 blah. No, it wasn't, you're invited to the service or the union of, because it was a sacrament. It was celebrated in a church with Holy Communion. You performed it, okay? And then you have another couple who is going to have a service at a venue. They're not having communion. It's not in a church. Is that considered not a sacramental? So speak, speak to that. The the, speak to that if you're not, you know, in front of a church altar with the elements as a part of that. Is right. So the question is, what is a sacramental marriage? Um, do you have to be, be married in a church? Does the mass have to be celebrated? Um, a sacramental marriage is a marriage between a baptized man and a woman. So both okay. parties have to be baptized. So um, that that makes a sacramental marriage. Um, it's not the where. Not the where. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you're good to go. <laughs> so, uh, and I remember that. I, I I remember that wedding and so well. I had been with a friend of mine who was a very learned man. He was a bishop. He's now retired in the Episcopal Church. And we were having lunch once, and he was saying. I married this couple the other day, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, no, you didn't marry them. They're, you're not married to them. Like, no. you solemnized their marriage. <laughs> so yeah. so when I, at the wedding that the questioner was referring to, I remember getting up saying specifically, I am not marrying them. 
I am already married. <laughs> I am here to pronounce God's blessing, and you all are here to witness that and confirm that. So it's kind of fun stuff. But language matters. Did you know language matters in life? It's the postmodernists that say you can just change language and language doesn't mean anything and words don't mean anything where we, we kind of get into trouble. Um, but yeah, the, lo the locale doesn't matter. Now, now, the prayer book says, shall come into the body of the church or be ready in some proper house. So that leaves room for, that leaves some wiggle room, you know. The Psalms say the earth is the Lord's and all that therein is. So there you go. Um, great question. Now I have never attended a wedding or solemn, uh, solemnized a marriage where someone got up and said, "You can't. They can't get married because blah blah blah." You know that's ever done. <laughs> I imagine it's happened somewhere. Okay, so we get we get now to the betrothal. On page 301, the minister shall say to the man, Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor her, and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? And the man shall answer, I will. And then the woman, page 301, says the exact same thing, I will. Um, so marriage here, this, this reveals something very important. Um, <clears throat> as long as ye both shall live. So marriage is intended by God to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman. Sacramental marriage. Um, so when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, we, 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 and the, what is the grace? Every sacrament has a grace. And that grace of the sacrament of matrimony, of holy matrimony, is, is God's strength to make it day by day by day by day by day by day. And someone says, Father oh, Gordon, you're just some priest. You don't know anything about marriage. Well, I've been married for how long? I don't even remember. I, I'm, I'm married, and it's tough. Marriage is, is work. But the grace of the sacrament helps us, helps us get going, uh, keep going day by day. Um, now, should you stay married no matter what, even if it is sacramental? It's a really tough question. It really depends on the circumstances and the situation. If you're in an abusive situation, absolutely not. You need to get out and be safe and keep your kids safe. There are a bunch of psychos out there that beat people up and, and, and molest. People are most likely to be molested by family members, uh, children, that is. So you should never stay in a, in a marriage where you're abused uh, physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, you should never do that. You know, you have to take care of yourself and be safe. God wants us to be saved and find eternal life. To do that, we have to live this life, and you can't do that when you've been beaten up and killed and hurt. And God understands that. God knows exactly what we're going through and he understands our weakness and the situations that we're sometimes put in it um, seems to me that if someone imparts that on another human being then they've invalidated the words that are in this book absolutely. which makes it non-sacramental yeah point, so. yeah they have um the if someone engages in that behavior they have invalidated mm -hmm. these words now say paul says something interesting in Corinthians. He says, let's say, I'm paraphrasing here, Are you, you know the verse, I'm not going to bother looking it up. Um, let's say you're married to an unbeliever and they're not interested in all this Christianity stuff. Should you leave them? Look, if they want to live with you and they're at peace with it, nah, just stay with them, that's fine. You know, your grace will spill over to them and, and help them grow. You know, so Paul's not saying, you know, just divorce people willy-nilly if, if they don't come to the Bible study with you or they don't believe. Like, maybe some people become a Christian later in life, um, you know, and then the spouse says, what? I'm, I'm not going to church anywhere. I'm going to stay home and watch a football game. Should you dump his butt? Absolutely not, especially if you have kids involved. 
um, Paul says that the, un the believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse. If they're willing to live together in peace, then live together in peace, go have a drink and, you know, make a life. Chill. So, there we are. Now, 301, continuing. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? That's when the, the, and the rubric says, the minister receiving the woman at her father, father's or friend's hands shall cause the man with his right hand to take the woman by her right hand and say after him as followeth. This has been lambasted uh, in recent years as being patriarchal because of views of women as property. Well, that may have been the case. You know, this is very ancient. Uh, this is actually Roman, where this tradition comes from. Um, but we would view it now as the loving handing over of a father who's been protecting the daughter to this man who is now gonna gonna take care of her. So it's, it's viewed now as as a loving as a loving gesture. And it says here, you know, friends can do it or family or or someone else. So we don't say, oh, you don't have a father. Well, sorry, you're out of luck. Okay, now bottom of three hundred one. The man says, um, the man says to the woman, I take thee to my wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. The troth means faithfulness. Um, Good words to remember. You should always go back and meditate on the, the right of holy matrimony every now and then. Remember those vows that you've made. Now, this is different from the, from the uh, English prayer book. Let's, let's read the English prayer book. <clears throat> I take thee to my wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to death us do part, according to thy... Oh, no, that's not what I was referring to. Um, okay, I'll... okay. The, the woman, back to uh, page 302 in the 28th prayer book, the woman says the exact same thing. Now, here's what I want to mention. You might see this in a movie sometime. You might hear it in an old, like, British wedding. Um, the woman says... I has an extra clause added to my wedded husband to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, and to obey till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my troth, I give thee my faithfulness, to obey. So that's in the 1662 prayer book. Uh, we heard that in, in St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians. Now, there is a, there is a balance of power here, which we will see in just one second, which is very interesting. This, of course, has been taken out of our prayer book. Um, let's go back to our prayer book, page 302. The man says to the woman, With this ring, I thee wed, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's our truncated right in the prayer book. In, in our prayer book. What does the English say? With this ring I be wed, with my body I be worship, and with all my worldly goods I be endow in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I had it explained to me by an Englishman nonetheless, himself, a priest. Um, what, what do men care about the most in life? Men care about their stuff. What's that old joke? He who died with the most toys wins. We like our stuff. So if I'm going to give you all of my stuff, please do what I say with it. Because <laughs> my stuff is so important to me. So it's this interesting little balance of power thing. Of course, to us, it's redundant. We don't have that in our, uh, in our um, prayer book, right? But it's an interesting, you know, anachronism that has some measure of truth to it, you know, with, with our... Crap, and believe you me, I've got a whole ton of crap at home. Um, and I, I trust that my wife will well, be and there was, great with it. There was a phrase about, like, uh, could you read it again? <laughs> Would you mind? 
No, there was a phrase about like like a, no, there was a phrase about like worshiping you or with my body I thee worship. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Right. So that's pretty extreme. I mean, that's you know that's extreme. Yeah, exactly. And worship is to offer someone their work, their due, their honor. Yeah. And so if you're doing that to a your wife, then it's not a, a domineering. Yeah. It's just an honoring thing. It's an honoring thing. Yeah. And that's why, um, you know, the way our prayer book has the passage from Ephesians written for the epistle for a nuptial mass is, is great. Um, because it says, it starts off with the whole bottom line. Submit to one another. The husband and wife submit to one another. That's really what it all boils down to. Now, in, in reality, um, the uh, husbands need to do more submitting and listening to their wives. I read this by uh, this, this psychologist, Jonathan Gottman, of the Gottman Institute, which is a premier marriage counseling. Um, it's, he runs it with his wife. It's, it's really incredible stuff, Gottman. And statistically, um, sort of naturally, according to their years of research of all sorts of couples, the wife tends to like naturally kind of listen to the husband and, and follow along. How much more important then, he says, it is for the husband, when she says, listen, you better listen. Because she's got something to say. Like, we're just so used to having, you know, our, our wife come along and you know support us which is wonderful you have a great wife fantastic but when she speaks we need to listen and make an effort to because we tend to just like not listen and blow blow off whatever you know i do know some of us i'm a man so you know so it's very important and this this is gottman is not he's a i think a secular jewish guy okay so this is just based on on research that he and his wife and their foundation have done over decades. Um, very important, you know, so we should submit. The Bible's right all along. Submit to one another. Submit to one another. Listen to each other. Serve one another. Christ came to serve the church. How did he serve the church? He died. He gave up and bled to death and was brutalized and beat up and buried in a tomb for the church. So we, we serve one another um, to bring each other to salvation. Now, does marriage last forever? Nope. The uh, marriage ends when a spouse dies. You know, one of the, the spouses dies. Uh, Jesus, in meeting with the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, the famous passage from the Gospels, which we have in our prayer book lectionary during Trinity Tide, the, um, the Sadducees come up to him and say, in marriage, you know, this uh, man was married to a woman, and uh, he died, and then she married his brother, and then he died, and she married the other brother, and he died. That was an old Jewish tradition called Leverite marriage. And they say, so, she goes to heaven, whose wife will she be? And they weren't even interested in the question. It's a fascinating piece because the whole thing with the Sadducees is they, they don't believe they didn't believe in an afterlife or heaven, so they were trying to trick them up about that. But Jesus doesn't even address that. He says, "You don't understand the scriptures. In marriage, uh, in in heaven, people are like angels. They're not given away in marriage. So that doesn't mean we become angels. That's a whole other topic. Uh, but it, once." Uh, someone dies, that break, the marriage bond is broken. The sacramental marriage bond is broken. Um, and there's no, you know, anyone is, is free to remarry um, as he or she wishes or remain single. Um, so there we are. Uh, so marriage does not last forever. And now in some religions it does. In the Mormon religion, you know, marriage does last forever. And you marry as many wives as you can, and then you become a god and populate your own planet, which is where their whole history of polygamy comes from. And in, in heaven and in the afterlife, women are eternally pregnant, bearing, bearing children. So how does that sound for heaven? 
uh, I've not been pregnant myself, but I, from what I've heard, it's not exactly being in heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there we are. Um, now, interesting thing here, in our right, I've always found this interesting, the man places the ring on his wife's finger. There is no wife placing a ring on the husband's finger in, in the 1928 prayer book. So why is that? Well, it's just because it wasn't really a custom for men to wear wedding rings until, until like the late 20s or the 30s. It was something that was apparently, I researched this a little bit, it was kind of dreamed up by some of the jewelry magnets, like, hey, we could, you know, as long as you're buying this, why don't you give him a ring? So what we do now is, and I'm sure I'm not the only priest that, that does this, you place both rings on the prayer book. There's a prayer of blessing. You can bless the rings. That's not in the English rite, but it's in our rite. Um, and then I, we have the, the man place the ring on the woman's finger. He says, with this ring, I be wed. And then the woman does the exact same thing. So there we are. Some men don't like to wear wedding rings. Um, you know. And you don't have to have a wedding ring. Like if you don't have a wedding ring or you've lost your ring, that has nothing to do with the validity of the right or your marriage is broken. It's not the ring of power like in the Lord of the Rings. In fact, I have a priest friend who I was looking at his ring one day and it, honest to God, it looked like a little gasket, like a little black rubber gasket. And I said to him, that's an interesting ring. He said, yeah, I always lose my wedding ring. I just, I've always lost it, so I still lose it, so I, we just, I just wear, I get a new one. He, the guy can't keep track of, of rings. You know? we're, we're doing both for him. Doing both? Yeah, because of what his, the nature of his job, the ring would be ruined. Right. So, you know, so he's going to have one so that when we're together and we're, you know, in normal stuff, he'll have a band, but then he's wearing this, you get these rubber, like, band things, and that's what he'll wear for work. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Just a symbol. You don't have to have a ring to be married, you know. Um, you know, it's a, that is an old um, uh, medieval custom, where, you know, you put an engagement ring on the, the your fiancé's finger, the, the, man, the wealthy duke did, or whatever, and you know, and it just balloon from there. Um, so you, you don't have to have a ring. Um, so, we continuing. Okay. There's a prayer. The, the Lord's Prayer is said, now we discussed this at some of our earlier sessions, the Lord's Prayer is read at every sacrament of the church. Baptism, communion, confirmation, ordination, the, the key prayer of the church there, the prayer as our Lord taught us to pray. And then there's a prayer that the priest adds, O on three, oh three, eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, author of everlasting salvation, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name, that they living together, faithfully together, may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt this maid, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge. So the ring symbolizes these pledges and the, you know, the seriousness of this situation, but does not confect it. And may ever remain in perfect love and peace together and live according to thy laws through Jesus Christ our Lord. So they, we ask God's blessing that, okay, they made these vows, they, in front of everyone, everyone's here, please give them help to just make it through and, and fulfill them. Then the minister may add one or both of the following prayers. Prayer for children, obviously if the couple is of childbearing age. Um, bestow upon these thy servants, if it be thy will, the gift and heritage of children, and grant that they may see their children brought up in thy faith and fear to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. I was once asked, I had to fill in for a marriage service um, for a priest friend of mine. He got violently ill from some bad calamari. So I had to fill in in Southern Maryland for a wedding of these uh, 
they weren't quite empty nesters, but they were on their way. Young couple, young couple still, but they had older kids. There was a second marriage for both of them. And we're going over the right, and I said, no, do you want me to say this prayer for our kids? And they're like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is actually, you know, not, not a bad thing to consider, because if you've got kids from a previous marriage, she's got kids from a previous marriage, and then you have one together, guess who gets all the attention? That one, and then their jilted John, you know. So I will leave that, that there. So that's only if, you know, the people are able to have, have kids. Um, and then we have the other prayer, which we read here at the church. O God, who has so consecrated the state of matrimony that in it is represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church, Ephesians chapter 5. Look mercifully upon these thy servants, that they may love, honor, and cherish each other, and so live together in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and of peace through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Spirit ever, one God, world without end. So again, it's a, it's a prayer where we ask God to give the couple grace to fulfill these vows, to be patient with one another, um, and that their home may be uh, a blessing. And the home, the Christian home, is really the foundation of the church. Um, it's very, very uh, important uh, where kids are brought up, they're, they're brought into the world, they're reared. I was told years ago that kids are reared, not raised. You raise animals, you rear children. So we rear our children, um, so that they might uh, come to know and love the Lord and serve him all of their days and live happy, healthy lives. Uh, those who God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And then the right ends. For as much as N and N have consented together in holy wedlock, so they've consented together, had witnessed the same before God in this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth to each other, their faithfulness to each other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving a ring, and by joining hands, I pronounce that they are man and wife in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So the priest is, is just declaring what they've already decided as a foregone act. So even if you get married at the courthouse, um, you're two baptized, the man and the woman, it's a sacramental marriage. You don't have to have the blessing and all of that. It is considered in the church, in the eyes of the church, a sacramental marriage, something that conveys God's grace. Now you can, if you do have a wedding in those circumstances, and you decide to start going to church, you can have your marriage blessed. Um, that's fine. There's a right for that. Um, but but God, God is with you. And then there's a benediction. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost bless, preserve, and keep you. I won't read the rest of it. You can check it out for yourself. Now, let's look at the rubrics. They're very important. The laws respecting matrimony, whether by publishing the bans in churches or by license, being different in several states, Every minister is left to the discretion of those laws and everything that regards the civil contract between the parties. The church only recognizes marriages that the state recognizes. So you can't have some situation where, well, me and Sally here, we just, you know, have committed our lives together in a deep time of prayer to be married. And we consider ourselves husband and wife. Fantastic. Get a marriage license? No, we, we don't do that. We never did that. That's not recognized as a, the church would not recognize that as a valid marriage. Now, does the church recognize every marriage that the state recognizes? Absolutely not. So, if there's a divorce that complicates things, a divorce and a remarriage that complicates things, the church does not recognize same-sex marriages. Um, that does not mean that those are not marriages in the eyes of the state or the eyes of other people or that it's God just a civil can't union. bring. Yeah, it's a civil union. It doesn't mean that God can't even bring something good out of that, you know? Um, but for a sacramental marriage, it is a man and a woman in a lifelong union married according to the laws of the state. So you have to get a wedding, you know, marriage license and all that. Um, and the clergy.
clerk, the clerk you sign it. Um, I think um, I think ship captains can marry people, can't they? Yeah. Right. Like yeah, like on a cruise ship, it's some weird thing. Yeah. yeah. So. And then there's the bans of marriage. That's the second rubric. When the bans are published, it shall be in the following forum, which we had in our bulletin on Sunday. Um, I published the bans of marriage between this person and this person. If any of you know just cause or impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it. This is the first, second, or third time of asking. So we have to put that in the bulletin. I've actually seen that nailed to church doors before. Um, you know, so, you know, well, you can't marry this person. I'm married to that person. Like, what's going on here? You know, this is all stuff that the that concerns the peace of our society, the state, the safety and well-being of children, inheritance, and things like that. So it's, um, it's all, it all, like, kind of ties together. Now, you can have just that service right there and be done, or you can then continue and have the service of, of uh, a Holy Communion. Uh, it is actually added right to the English uh, prayer book. Um, See you, take care. Service, you head out. See you. Um, but in our prayer book, uh, the service of Holy Matrimony ends right at that blessing. And then if you were to decide you wanted a nuptial mass, Holy Communion celebrated at, at your wedding, then you would just have the communion service with the propers for marriage. So let's just look and we'll close out in a minute here. We'll look at the um, collect for matrimony. Because again, what the church prays is what she believes. So what is the, what do we pray? This is on page 267, at a marriage. O eternal God, we humbly beseech thee favorably to behold these thy servants, now who are about to be joined in wedlock according to thy holy ordinance. Grant that they, seeking first thy kingdom and thy righteousness, may obtain the manifold blessings of thy grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that is a beautiful colic. We marry not only just because we're madly in love with our beloved and we want to build a life and have kids and do all that stuff and burst out into the future and build, some, build a life together, but ultimately to glorify God, which is why we do all things in life and to be made holy and find everlasting salvation. And who knows what life will bring us um, in, in marriage and in, in family, uh, but we trust that God is always with us as we commit our lives to him and faithfully serve him. So I'm going to stop there. Do we have any questions or comments before I end things here? Look at my... I have a question. Yes, Beth. So if a couple comes to you and they don't ever want to have children, they want to be married, they want to travel, they have no interest in raising a family, but that's one of the three things for the reason to be married. They, they, so, is that still okay? I don't. I wouldn't do it. I would not do a wedding. Because I've heard. I actually know of someone who flat out said, "You know, I'm going to be married someday, but I'm never having kids. I don't ever want to have kids. You know, I'm, they're too selfish to have kids." They, so, you know, then that's a problem. You probably maybe shouldn't have been married. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people I've noticed in years in ministry will say certain things and with a lot of bluster and make comments like that, and then as you get to know them and they feel comfortable around you, there's a lot of damage underneath, and they have a really good reason why, okay. now maybe not always, but a really good reason why they don't want to have kids. Okay. Um, and it's been years when I've been in ministry, known people, and after maybe eight or nine years, they come to me and open up about some massive trauma in their lives, and uh, now things make a little bit of sense with this person. So you never know. Now, I would not, I personally would not do a wedding like that. Would I say, well, you're going to hell and you're just, you know, you know, the scum of the earth. I would just do that. Go find some other priest or minister to do it. They'll, they'll do it. 
I could not do that in good conscience. Or have a civil marriage. Or have a civil marriage, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, so. Um, good question. I had another comment, too. I always love, when Tom and I had this in our wedding, this part from Ephesians where it says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. So, you know, that verse substantiates, you know, oh, well, we just want to live together. No, because he, you know, the leave and cleave. You leave and you cleave to your wife, meaning you're already married, and then you become one flesh. You know, yeah. in, in, in many aspects of that, including physical. So, you know, you don't do that until you're married. Right, exactly. So I love how that substantiates that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, leave, leave and cleave and, and, and build, a, build a life together. And um, oftentimes, very sadly, it's the women who get jilted in those situations, you know, and it's really unfair. I mean, as if, you know, women don't get treated badly enough in society and in the world, they have, they shack up with some guy who's leading them along and then he just, no, I don't want to get married, I don't want to have kids. I mean, it's really, really despicable, you know, so, you know, men need to be men and, um, and, and grow up. You know, I mean, I, I was listening to, uh, <laughs> so seeing the not doctor. just men, men too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Play with fire, you get burned. That's right. That's I was going to ask you, Father, do you have a personal practice of counseling, marriage counseling, prior to the sacrament, or do you, does it not always work out that way? Like, do you meet with the couple? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meet like three or four times, and you know. Give, go over the right, using the right to, ex the question is do I have a practice um, counseling those coming to be married? And I do, it's required in the canons of the church. Um, so I meet together three or four times, you know, just basically go over the right and explain, you know, like we did tonight, what everything means. Um, could be a, a young couple, they have a completely different approach to it. They've never been married, maybe they live together a little bit, but they're not married yet and they're in college versus people who are empty oh. nesters, you know? <laughs> oh. Wise. So it, it all- Yeah, a lot wiser this time, that's for sure. It all just, you know, kind of kind of depends, you know, on, on the situation, um, you know, so you have to kind of tailor things a little bit. But yeah, we're required to, in, in church law, you're not supposed to just um, marry anyone that comes along, even if there's no impediments, they're complete strangers to you. Also, marriages are, by tradition, not solemnized during Lent, during Advent, or on Sundays. So, um, no Sunday weddings. Yeah, no Sunday weddings, yeah. So you can get a dispensation from the bishop for those things, but Lent, like we're right now, being a penitential season is not a time for a big celebration, um, though it does happen, it has been known to happen. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, cust customs involved. So any other questions or comments? Well, thank you for joining us this evening. We will now close with prayer. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in thy mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. See you next week for the last se session. Uh, holy orders. Doo -doo -doo. Bye now.